Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, before we get started, uh, if we could just do a quick sound check to make sure that you can hear me clearly and see the screen that says Future City Educator Best Practices and Advice Webinar. If you could just click on the raise hand button on your webinar control panel to make sure you can hear me clearly and see um, the screen. Great. Thank you all. Excellent. Thank you very much. Well, welcome to the 2019 Future City Educator Best Practices and Advice webinar hosted by Future City Headquarters. Uh, my name is Jake Williams, and I'm the program coordinator for the Future City competition. Also on the line is Maggie Dressel. She's the program manager for the competition. And Maggie will be staffing the question box today. So as we go along, feel free to type any questions that you have. Uh, Maggie and I work for the Future City Headquarters office in Northern Virginia, just outside of Washington, D.C. Uh, we develop materials like the program handbook, um, we coordinate and run the finals competition in February, um, and we support the uh, really amazing regional coordinators who run the local regional competitions which take place um, throughout January. As you probably know, uh, Future City is a program that influences and inspires both kids and adults. Uh, middle schoolers discover the wonders of engineering and math and science and art and technology. Uh, they get to learn about real world problems and are able to develop their own creative solutions. They have the opportunity to build things with their own hands um, and then confidently present their work to professionals. Similarly, each year I get to hear from adults, uh, from mentors and judges and competition volunteers um, who all tell me that they feel so optimistic or excited or thankful after seeing what the kids have done. Um, they feel more confident that this next generation of innovators and change makers are well on their way to improving our world. Um, and the Future City competition provides a framework for this, uh, but as you know, it's the kids who do it themselves. And it's you, the educators, who facilitate it and provide them the tools to do this really great work. So the purpose of this webinar today um, is to help you sharpen those tools. Um, the Future City program has a lot of moving parts, and there's definitely not one single right way to do it. Um, however, uh, there are definitely strategies for how to get the most out of the process um, and the program. Um, so therefore, each year we talk to, to different experienced Future City educators um, who share their best practices and advice um, on a variety of things related to the program um, to help you get the most out of your Future City experience. Uh, if you're brand new to the program or if you've just um, just kind of looking for a refresher, be sure to also check out the recording from our new educator webinar from this past May. Um, it's an introduction to the general structure of the program um, and it's available now in the resources section of futurecity.org. Uh, this web webinar today will be a bit more of a deeper dive into techniques for um, success with the program. Um, and as I mentioned before, there's no single right way to do Future City, um, but it's always beneficial to hear from experienced, passionate people. Um, so that's what we're here to do today. Uh, before we begin, just a few housekeeping items. Um, the platform we're using today is GoToWebinar. Um, if the sound quality is not great on your computer speakers, uh, you might want to try calling in on the teleconference line. Um, that information is here. The phone number, just dial in here, and then use this access code. Um, the audio pin will show up after you've joined the webinar, um, and you can sign in through um, this teleconference line um, and the sound uh, sometimes a little bit better over the phone. Um, also, as with our past recording, past uh, webinars, the recording of this webinar is going to be posted on futurecity.org in the resources section um, in the next couple days. Um, so if you have anything um, that you'd like to go back and rewatch, or um, if you'd like to share this with any colleagues, um, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, again, here's the number in case you are uh, wanting to call in. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, Maggie Dressel is on the line answering any questions that you have. So just uh, type in into the question box in the control panel um, throughout the program if you have any questions. Um, and at the end, we'll pose as many as we can um, to our panelists. Um, and Maggie will be able to answer any um, technical program questions that you might have. 
Um, so now I'd like to introduce our fantastic panel. Um, we have two excellent um, educators uh, who are going to talk a bit about their experiences. Uh, Leandra Brandel is in her ninth year as a special education teacher and recently finished her Doctor of Education um, in Educational Leadership with a focus on curriculum and instruction. Currently she teaches for Wald Lake Consolidated Schools in Michigan at Geisler Middle School. Along with her co-leads, she runs a Future City Group after school. Um, after school program. Um, she's going into her second year as a Future City Ambassador and is working to educate and advocate for STEM-based real-world learning through inclusion of Future City and Underwriters Laboratories Explore Labs program. Leandra, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Also with us is Willette Whitaker. Um, she first became introduced to Future City when her son, who's now a freshman in college, was a fifth grade student at Blair Christian Academy. Um, the following year, Willette became a middle school teacher at the school and stepped in as the educator for the Future City team. Um, her husband, a structural engineer, has also been the school's mentor for the past eight years. Willette brings the expertise of competing in Future City with the limited resources and a small number of students. On average, BCA has a total of seven to 10 students who participate in the competition as a whole. And she's always amazed and excited to see what the students are able to come up with um, and the enthusiasm that they have throughout the entire competition process. Uh, Willette, thank you very much for being here today. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. So let's get right into it. Um, so first, let's uh, take a moment to talk a little bit about the settings, um, because as I mentioned before, there are a ton of different ways to implement Future City. Um, so Leandra, um, could you please briefly describe how your Future City program functions? Um, how often do you meet? Where do you meet? What kind of um, setup is your Future City program? Um, so our school is a sixth through eight middle school, so we welcome any students sixth through eighth grade. Our program, the way we design it, is we try to meet once a week at the very beginning. Our school year starts anywhere, depending on the way Michigan is working and our district's working, the week before Labor Day or, um, or after Labor Day. So we try to get it up and running as quickly as possible, um, typically reaching out to just the student base we had from the year before that's still in middle school. And then they are the ones who do the, like the recruiting process. So we meet once a week um, until we recognize a need to increase more. Um, so we usually do an hour after school. So like right now we're meeting typically Tuesdays are after school day, three to four. Um, and then we just kind of assess as we keep going. We've noticed in the past, it seems to be about November that we recognize, okay, to, in order to meet the certain standards, um, meeting very, whether it be SimCity, the SA, or just wanting to get a head start on the model building, um, we tend to pick it up two times. And then we'll notice even before the competition, because Michigan holds theirs typically the last week of January, um, we'll notice usually the week or two before, it can be up to three times a week. Um, and at that point, it's usually an hour and a half to two hours after school. Excellent, very good. Um, well, that same question. Um, could you talk a little bit about um, how your Future City program works? Sure. So um, our Future City program is actually a part of our curriculum. It is considered an elective for our middle school students. Um, because we are a small school, all of the students are um, a part of the team. So right now they meet on Thursdays from 8 to 930. So that is their hour and a half class time. Um, that is weekly. And then um, they also have to commit during the holiday Christmas break um, that there's times that we have that they come in and then uh, once we get closer to the competition, we meet in the afternoons and on the weekends as well. Excellent. Uh, Leandra, how did your school um, get involved with Future City originally? How did um, how was it brought to the to the um, school? It was actually a student who did it as a part of um, his cultural center, and the people he was training with were no longer in middle school. They were on to high school, and he was the last one left in middle school. And so he brought it to the idea of actually another teacher in our building who was a science teacher and she's like sure I have no idea what this is and took it on board and reached out to the staff and said anybody interested. Um, I knew nothing about Future City at the time however growing up I was in what's called Michigan Future Problem Solvers which has a similar component to Future City as it's problem solving based. Um, very very similar for the most part. 
So I said, oh, I'll hop on board. I'll help with this. Um, she ended up finding it was just a little bit too much, um, but I fell in love with it. Our design tech teacher then joined me on board. Um, so him and I have been co-leading it for the last four years is just us. Um, so that's kind of, it was because of a student that had done it as a part of like his culture, a local cultural center that we learned about it. Otherwise that we had no knowledge as a teacher group. So that was pretty cool. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Willette, how has your future city grown or expanded um, since you started um, as the educator? Um, it's actually grown tremendously. The first year that we did it, it was only eighth grade students who participated. Um, and the first year that we started it, a teacher knew about it from another organization, but she didn't know the details. And so uh, the first year they went to the competition, they were quite ill prepared. Um, they didn't know um, about doing some type of skit or presentation. Somehow they missed that piece of it. Um, and their model, um, they felt that it, it didn't compete, wasn't on the same level as the other schools. But what happened from that was that the students walked away with some confidence and went through the booklet um, a little with a little more detail and saw exactly what they needed to do. So the next year, they were able to go back and feel confident about their presentation. So even though it wasn't um, on the top scale of some of the other schools, they at least felt that they belonged at the competition. And so each year, uh, we decided decided to add a younger group to it because we were finding that once our eighth graders graduated that the next group didn't have any knowledge of Future City at all. So now we allow even our fifth grade students to be a part of the class time. They don't go to the competition with us, but at least it grooms them so that as they become sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, they're familiar, they know exactly what needs to be done, um, and they're able to be a little more competitive with um, their essay, with their sim city, with their presentation, and their model. It's really grown a lot since uh, just the eighth graders doing it. It's mm -hmm. great. Excellent. Um, now moving on to um, the, the sizes of the teams. Um, there's a lot of different ways different educators choose to do this, um, and it's definitely a good idea to check in with your regional coordinator um, to see if there are specific um, restrictions or rules on team size at your regional competition. Um, but Leandra, what size team do you prefer to work with, and what are some of the pros or cons, uh, pros and cons of having a team of this size that you work with? So. Oh. Preferably, I would like to work with 15 or under. Um, last year, we got a huge influx of sixth graders that were super interested. And we ended up having, I wanna say it was like 40 kids to start out the school year, about 30 year, thirty that held on all the way through the end. So what we ended up doing was splitting into two teams, um, but that we found was just crazy to manage. And coming back this year, because we had a lot of eighth grade students leave us we're at a, sitting at about 12 students and as bad as it sounds we're not actually pushing too much because we have a really good group of seventh graders that can outreach the next year um, we're not doing so much pushing this year just because we learn um, in the past it seems we've had better success when our team is 15 or less versus 30 students even though we split into two teams um, there was just a a lot going on um, whereas the 15 to less was like that 12 is about what we've seen to find is like our really nice sitting number for being able to the kids to really get like heavily involved in every aspect mm -hmm. and we'll let the same question what are the what seem, team size do you like most to work with and what are some of the the benefits and some of the negative sides of, of working with a, a team that's that size well, we've only had the opportunity to work with small teams. However, um, I used to always feel when we went to competitions, wow, we could possibly do a whole lot more if we had just five or 10 more students. But then I would hear um, some of the other educators speak about the disadvantages and the cons of having such a large group. And I think, well, maybe this is a good size that we have. So we generally um, average between seven and 12. This year we have 10 students. Um, I will say at crunch time, it gets to be a little 
challenging to meet all of the expectations and on time because when you have a small group of students, you have to work with the resources they bring as opposed to having a larger group and be able to pull the strengths from various students. And so, you know, there have been years where we might not have had too many strong writers on the team or um, we might not have had students who were really interested in the SimCity program, but we had to have everyone participate and do it because that was all we had. So sometimes I feel like having a larger group at least gives you a pool of strengths to pull from. Um, but I will say I haven't had um, the opportunity to have a large group to see if that's really true to course. Um, but it just seems like it when you have a small group, you're looking um, at the option of if I had so many more, what could I do? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, Leandra, um, moving on to team structures and how roles are assigned. Um, you have a you work with a slightly larger um, team than you have in the past. Um, how are roles determined? Um, how do you figure out who's going to be the official presenter, who will work on which deliverable? What's your process um, for that? I've been pretty fortunate that year after year it seems to fall that it kind of divvies up pretty equally. I've noticed the boys love SimCity. So, the girls who typically have zero interest in that and they want to work on the essay. So that's kind of at the very beginning that figures itself out without me much having to do anything. Um, and then they just all come together for the model. And then you, at that point, that's when you see who are the leaders. And it's typically the ones who end up leading at that point are the ones who also want to present. So for the most part, it hasn't been a ton of me intervening, me assigning specifically, just because I've been able to see who are my leaders within the leaders of like my student leader body that's there. Um, and there's just ones that are stronger and more prominent and have greater interest and in, like some want to do this and some want to do this and they just usually all meshes together just fine. Great. Um, well, Let, how do you address conflict um, when it comes up between your team members? Um, so quite often they're actually able to resolve their conflicts themselves. Um, they, the, the biggest conflict from year to year is what's to name the city. And so um, they all have to come up with a name for the city, decide you know, why they want to pick that city. And because it's a small group, everyone wants their city to win. So we talk about, you know, well, what's the purpose? We want to make sure um, that everything we do, we're not just picking um, the answer because our friends are doing it or um, because we this person is a little more popular. But at the end of the day, we want to be able to present well and to have um, a good um, deliverable. So we tend to go back and focus on what is our ultimate goal and put the feelings aside and not, you know, focus on what each person wants, but the greater good of the entire team. So I think when I'm able to remind them that, you know, we're together we're a school, we're competing against other schools, it's not individuals competing against one another, but it's us collectively working together as a team, um, that they're able to put feelings aside and say, okay, this is probably the best um, resolution for our team to do well and to move forward. So um, generally, that works for us. Great. Um, Leandra, um, when in the school year do you typically start? Um, do you um, begin when the school year begins? When is that? How, how do you? How does your kind of general overall um, calendar for working on Future City um, typically um, happen? Um, we typically be begin right when our school calendar begins. Um, usually, like within, I would say, not necessarily the first week since that's the kids getting back to everything, but by the second week, we at least have like an introductory let's touch base meeting. Um, and for there, we kind of figure out what day is going to work best for each of the kids to get together, um, looking at collectively as a whole um, what's going to be able to get the kids there. So we try to get started right off the bat, um, even though it's like our first meeting is more introductory, then by that second meeting, we are like, Pull in, let's start brainstorming, and that kind of idea. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, well, that, um, how do you approach the deliverables do, with your students? Do you kind of follow them in order of the handbook? Um, do you work on some of them simultaneously? Um, do, do your students uh, tend to um, do just one at a time, or do they overlap? How does, how does that tend to work? So we work on STEM City and the essay simultaneously because um, at the beginning we have all of the students 
kind of try their hand at SimCity to see um, who's able to really take and then run with it. Um, and then those who aren't interested tend to want to focus on the essay. So we do those two simultaneously and we break them up into two groups. Um, for the model, everyone works on it together. And we do that after um, we have the essay done because the essay gen generally drives what the model is going to look like. Um, so everyone kind of comes back together and gets on board to do the model. I will say each year we feel that we start the model entirely too late. And, at, you know, at Christmas time, we're here over Christmas break trying to finish it up. And each year we say we're going to do it sooner to start it with the other deliverables. But, um, it's hard to start the model any sooner, at least for us, um, any sooner than after the essay is done so that we exactly know what we're doing. But the two we do hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Great. And we'll get into the project plan a little bit later in the webinar. Um, but while we're here discussing the kind of time management um, component of it, um, it's great to remember to keep in mind mm -hmm. that it's not just something to be turned in um, at your region, um, but it's a really useful tool um, for your team to structure and plan um, their work, um, the the project plan as well. So we'll we'll get into that a little bit later, but just as a reminder for all the attendees, um, it's not just um, something to turn in, it's a tool for you and your team. Uh, Leandra, um, how do you encourage good positive communication between your team members? Um, the best thing I think with the students is I just kind of, I mean, I'm overseeing everything so I can chime in um, when necessary. Um, my students have also found because our district is very, very heavy into Google, and I know that's kind of tying in the second question that you have out there, but um, the students actually find that as a very valuable way to communicate with one another. So they can be on different workstations. And for example, just this past week, my group of girls that are wanting to start jumpstart the essay are trying to figure out innovative ways to address the problem and what's the two innovative ways they can come up with. So they've started a, a document that they're just keeping track of all the different things that are currently out there, how could they improvise, and they just, they kind of run with the technology aspect of it to utilize that to facilitate that good communication between them. Excellent. Uh, Willette, the same question. Um, how do you encourage good positive communication and what are some um, tools that you um, encourage your team members to use for planning purposes? Um, so they, the students happen to all be good friends. They actually have classes together. Um, as a whole, so our class time here is just an offspring of their other classes. So they tend to communicate via email, um, via text. Um, they're, they're together all day, so communication hasn't been uh, an issue for us at all. Um, I think the biggest piece is, is the respectful communication and making sure that they're listening um, to each other's ideas. And um, my role is to make sure that everyone's ideas are heard so that it isn't one person taking the lead and everyone else following, but that each team member has an opportunity to share. Um, and not just the opportunity, but we make sure that they share. We do have some quieter team members who may not feel as confident. Uh, we try to make sure that their thoughts are brought out as well. And with that, um, if we feel that people are dominating the conversation, we have time where we're just writing out ideas and then I go through and read them so that um, no one knows whose idea is being shared. And so um, that allows them to be respectful of everyone's idea because I'm reading them anonymously and then they, they get to decide on what they need to do from there. Oh, great idea, excellent. Um, moving on to the team mentor. Um, the mentor is the official member of the team, um, is an official member of the team um, who's a STEM professional who acts as sort of a role model and offers a window into the world of um, professional STEM. Uh, many mentors get involved because they know the students. Um, so you can see if you have any students who have a parent or other relative who's an engineer or city planner or works in a related field. Um, and if you don't have someone like that um, already connected with your group, um, you can reach out to your regional coordinator um, for assistance in getting paired with a mentor. Um, so, uh, Leandra, uh, do you have an official team mentor? We do, yeah. And could you let us know, tell us a little bit about um, how you found your mentor, how you got connected, um, and a little bit about the role that they play um, with your team? Yeah, our regional coordinator for Michigan um, connected him with 
us um, actually from the very beginnings of our time. Um, and his major role is he really just facilitates um, the conversations with the kids specifically when it comes to engineering. So I typically print out um, the kids when I go through the thing, for example, we always say like the essay is the blueprint for our entire project and that's how we describe it to the kids. Um, so when we're working on like outlining before they actually draft the essay, there's all those components that they have to address and that one big major piece being how does the engineering component play into the city and with addressing the problem. So they kind of use him as a source for information, even though they're doing research on their own, they come up with their own. And then I'm always encouraging, did you talk to Mr. Nyer to see like what's his feedback on it? Um, and they, that's kind of, he just more facilitates, gives feedback when needed. Um, especially in the model, he teaches the kids really well about like the scaling um, and how to scale things appropriately and kind of runs through a little mini lesson with the kids who are working on the model with that aspect. So just more just being there as a, a resource. If you're from a lot of people that the mentor is really useful for, for talking about the scale because they can, um, especially if their background is in um, engineering or architecture related kind of field, then um, they can kind of give firsthand experience about how they use scale um, with their own work, which can be very, very um, useful for the students to realize that it's, it's not just an arbitrary rule. There's a reason why the scale has to be accurate. Mm -hmm. um, so Willette, um, same question for you. Do you have an official team mentor at the moment? Yeah, so I guess this is the area where I feel most spoiled as an educator is that our team mentor is my husband, um, who's a structural engineer, and he's been um, our mentor for as long as I have been um, on the team. And then a number of his colleagues are also judges for Future City. And so um, we have been able to um, really utilize our team mentor in ways that many other schools um, are not. So I, I, I know we could not do this program without a team mentor um, and just being able to um, have him uh, whenever we need to is just such a great benefit and our team um, benefits greatly from that. Um, and I will piggyback on what Leandria said is that um, he brings the expertise of working uh, with students in regards to scale. Um, he tends to um, really take the lead with us uh, with the model and the moving part, um, and then just giving the students the um, engineering process and engineering background. And um, he's just been amazing. <laughs> and he's been amazing even though he's my husband too. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, and just as a reminder for um, attendees, um, if you if you don't have a, a mentor, um, it's that's uh, perfectly fine. It's not a, a requirement. We definitely encourage it um, because it's very useful um, for the the team. Um, but it's not a requirement uh, to attend the competition or participate. Um, and if you're not able to get a mentor, um, check in with your regional coordinator anyway. They can offer a lot of really great recommendations for, um, if not official formal mentors, at least maybe um, some ideas of possible people to connect with temporarily, people who can come into the classroom, discuss a little bit about the work that they do, um, or other kind of um, local uh, opportunities and resources that could be beneficial as well. Um, so moving on to the uh, Future City specific resources, uh, the handbook is available to download as a PDF in the resources section of futurecity.org, and you can also request a hard copy from your regional coordinator. Um, Willette, um, how do you approach the program handbook each year? What's your strategy for approaching the handbook? Uh, well, we read it from cover to cover, um, especially after the first year doing it and not reading it. Uh, we see how beneficial and necessary it is to um, make sure that we read it. We look at the uh, rubrics inside and kind of compare our models. We actually give the rubrics to some of our teachers so that when our students are presenting here at the school, they can grade them as well so that we can see um, if there are areas we missed or things that um, we didn't address that we have time to go back and um, incorporate them before the actual competition. Um, so they, they use it almost as a Bible that, you know, we just go through, make sure we have everything that's there. And sometimes there are things that we know 
um, we may not be able to handle, um, or if we look at some questions, we're like, hmm, we didn't quite meet that one, but at least we know ahead of time. So whenever we look at our scores after the fact, we know, yeah, that was an area we definitely missed or didn't address if it was because of time or lack of resources, or we just, you know, didn't quite understand how to put it in, at least the students know. So I encourage the students to really look through it and understand it. Um, and like I said, I give it to the teachers as well. Excellent. Um, and just as a reminder for all attendees, um, don't forget about the resource of the gallery section too, which is right next to the resources section. Um, this is a spot on the website where you can look through pictures of models, you can see high scoring essays, read act the actual essays themselves, um, and you can see uh, videos of presentations um, from finals um, from the top five. Um, so it's a really great opportunity to um, um, share with your team and show them kind of what very high scoring um, deliverables look like um, and uh, a very very useful resource to not forget about um, and also another um, resource that's in the actual resources section under rules and rubrics um, don't forget about uh, the rubrics themselves as well mentioned um, they are incredibly useful to provide to your teams um, you can see them in the handbook itself um, as well as these separate um, printable PDFs um, in the resources section. Um, so Leandra, how do you use the rubrics um, with your students? Um, the rubrics actually, same with um, how Willette already mentioned, they're something I print for every student and we go over. Um, so like my student city, like I said, my kids kind of divvy themselves up at the beginning of the year to kind of get up same with Willette, we go simultaneously with um, SimCity and the essay. So um, I just, we go over it. I meet with the small group of students of who's ever doing what, and we go and through target it. With the Sim, not SimCity, the essay, what we do is we go through the rubric and create what should the outline of the essay look like based on what the book offers along with what the rubric offers. And we highlight did we address this? Did we address this? And the kids make it their responsibility to go back through and make sure they hit each of the benchmarks on the rubric. So my kids know how to use the rubric. Um, I teach them how to use it and I kind of put it into their hands to take ownership of checking it. Excellent. And this is the, these are the same rubrics that the judges use. So all the, the material that will be used for um, judging, that's all there. So it's, um, it's there for, for the students to familiarize themselves with. Um, something that's new this year um, to note um, for all attendees, the um, honor statement, the competition expense form, and the homeschool affidavit are in the resources section of the website now. You just need to filter search for competition forms and project plans here. Um, they used to be in the um, program handbook. Um, they are no longer um, in the program handbook, those three um, forms. Um, instead, you can access them, um, you can print them out on the um, resources section of the website. Um, the media waiver will be an online form now. Um, we actually submitted on, online this year. Um, and the rules and instructions for the competition expense form are still in the handbook, um, but the actual forms themselves are now available in the resources section of futurecity.org. So now moving on to the meat of the program, um, as you all I'm sure know, there are five deliverables that make up the future city competition. Um, so we'll go through each of those now at this point. Um, Leandra, how does your team complete the project plan? Um, do you use specific technology in the same way that you had discussed with communication planning before? Um, how, do, how do you kind of tackle the project plan? Google Drive, like I said, our Google Docs is our big thing. So I take the format, um, I believe it's, I'm trying to think, it's a Word doc um, through that you can download off of the resources. And then I convert that into a Google Drive so that way my kids can access it. Um, in terms of determining team goals, we're pretty fortunate that we have a lot of technology. So we have projectors, we have doc cams. So I utilize all of that to like, I take notes as like the kids talk. Um, and then we go through as a whole team collectively, um, filling out the project plan, step-by-step -step type of idea. Um, in terms of the team schedule, I keep in contact with the team in terms of using Remind. So what I end up doing is I usually just screenshot one of our 
at some point during the year, I screenshot a section and then I just input the screenshot into the team schedule. So we're pretty a tech tech based um, group trying to just utilize the resources not, that our district has and that's out there free for educators. Great. Well, let um, how do you approach the project plan and how do you um, or how does your team come up with the goals um, that they'll um, put into the project plan? Um, so we have the students work on the project plan together at the beginning, and um, as I had mentioned before, um, I allow for each student to come up with their own goals, and then we talk about them as a team. Um, one one particular year, because of the past, um, one of the goals was just to make sure all of the deliverables were done in on time. And because we had turned in a few deliverable, deliverables late, uh, we didn't want to do that again because we know you lose point for that. And so that became a goal. And how do we achieve it? And how do we map out the schedule in order um, to make sure that all of the deliverables are ready and submitted on time? Um, so because it's a class, um, they meet together weekly. So we don't um, have to use much technology as far as sharing. Uh, with each other, um, but it's just something that we do as part of the class time. Great. Excellent. Um, don't forget, attendees, that the virtual city is a trial run before the team starts designing their own future city, um, but it's not their future city itself. The virtual city is not. Um, instead, it's sort of a chance for kids to experiment, to get ideas. Um, about things like city planning and management and city design, which they can then apply to their future city. Um, as many of you have also experienced, um, the technology in classrooms and after school programs is advancing very quickly, and SimCity software tech is not exactly keeping up with these changes. Mm -hmm. uh, we've had many educators and teams experience a lot of trouble with the processes of getting software downloaded, um, and it's not even permitted on some schools, um, some school districts' computers. Um, so, for these and other reasons, um, this will be the last year that SimCity is a component of Future City. Um, next season, we will not be having the virtual city as a deliverable, um, and we'll have more details on this forthcoming, um, but for the time being, um, please just be aware that this current competition cycle, so that's 2019, 2020, um, will be the last season for SimCity um, as a deliverable in the program. Um, so for this year, um, Leandra, what is your process for downloading SimCity onto computers? Do you use school computers or personal laptops? Um, how do you kind of, um, where do you, do you, does your team use SimCity? Um, we use our, so I, like, as I said, I co-lead with our design tech teacher. So he's like our CTE teacher. So he has a whole lab of computers. So we are able to download it on his computers. However, because of the whole district firewall, all the district permissions, we have to get somebody above us to plug in all the admin stuff. Um, but once that's done, it's literally, um, I mean, we had it installed because, of course, we came back this year and we were surprised with, hey, they got new computers they weren't telling us about. And so everything was wiped from the prior computer. So we just start from the very beginning of downloading everything, including Origin. So um, I was like, oh, great, this is going to take forever. But our um, tech person was able to get down within half hour, had everything installed. Well, let um, what do you do when you run into an issue with either origin or with downloading SimCity or running SimCity? What's what's your process for um, when when those issues come up? Well, in the past, we had issues because um, the computers we had in our lab were old and they couldn't um, accommodate SimCity, so we had to do it on laptops. But this year is actually the first year that we have um, a lab of new computers that we're able. Um, to download it, so I'm a little disappointed that this will be the last year because we're just getting with the ages and able to um, to work with it in our own computer lab. But we do have um, a person in IT who is able to troubleshoot um, with us and um, fix any glitches or problems we may have. We did just start using it um, in our computer lab just last week, and so far we haven't had any issues. Um, and I'm hoping that we don't this year um, because we've figured out the technology piece, um, but having someone in IT was definitely uh, very beneficial for us. Mm -hmm. 
Leandra, uh, what resources do you direct your students to if they have questions about SimCity or the virtual city deliverable? Um, honestly, the Future City website. I, I teach them from very early on how they can go on and find resources, and I teach them how to download them and look at them. So we have a student um, this year who he was with me um, seventh and eighth grade. Absolutely loved it. Like Sim City's his thing. Um, so he came back this year as a high schooler to mentor the middle school students on how to properly access SimCity, making sure to access the resources. So he's kind of taken on that um, role of doing that, which is great to see. Excellent. Uh, moving on to the city essay, um, we'll let you mentioned before you talked a little bit about how um, your team works on the essay. Um, how does how do they actually do the writing themselves? Does one person um, start out with it? Do they kind of split it up into um, each person taking a different section? Um, how how does your team do your teams tend to to approach the the essay? So I do work um, with the English teacher in um, doing research. Um, it becomes actually an assignment for them that's graded in the English class as well. Um, they do start off working on it individually the first two or three weeks uh, because everyone actually has to do an essay. But then um, as we get after that part is done, then we read each person's and we collaborate and put um, the different components together. So some, one student might be a little stronger um, in one area, another student might have found um, something different. So initially it starts as an individualized assignment and then we work collaboratively um, to submit the one final essay. Um, the biggest issue has been staying with the word limit, and so with that, we try um, to add charts or add pictures or something that um, can decrease the words but still get the information across. Mm -hmm. Great. And speaking of that, um, Leandra, um, how do you um, help your students stay within that 1500 word limit? Do you have strategies or tips or tricks um, for how you kind of keep them in that um, word limit? That's that's really not very many words. Um, the students are pretty good. Like I said, we use Google Docs, so it's a shared document that they're working on. And in the last couple of years, I've noticed that the team seems to want to like split section. We like outline it and then we split sections and they take on the role of writing it. Um, and they go back through like my main people go back through with the fine tooth comb check on Google Docs. They have a word count. So they check it off of that. Um, they make sure because, of course, they enjoy writing. Um, the ones who are doing this aspect of it, um, and they always tend to be a, a little bit over. So it's going back and where were we redundant? So it's a nice English aspect of teaching them how to stick to the main points. And that rubric also comes into play in terms of did you hit everything? Did you duplicate items that aren't necessary? So they kind of between using just a basic word count to checking with the rubric, they kind of utilize that to help them hone in on that 1500 word limit. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, and one last question on the essay. Um, will that, besides yourself, does anyone else proof or review the essay? Yes, so the, um, the English teacher does as well as our um, mentor. Great, that's great to get, get more people involved in that. Mm -hmm. Um, the fourth deliverable is the city model, um, which is one of the most kind of visually immediately recognizable parts of the Future City program. Um, Leandra, um, when do you start in the year working on the model and how does your teams work on the virtual city and the city essay before that impact and influence their work on the model? Um, we try to get started every year, <laughs> I think. It must be a future city teacher thing. We're always like, we need to get started on this sooner. Um, mm -hmm. That we're always on that crunch time, especially when it comes to that model and presentation at the very end. Um, so with the model, um, personally, this goal I said with my students, um, if we're trying to get it done actually before we go on Christmas break. I don't know if that's going to be totally possible, but we'll see. Um, especially because this group of students now the majority were first timers last year, so they've been through it. Now they kind of know the experience. Um, so we, our goal is to get an outline. Um, I said I'd like to see their essay be done by 
October, end of October, um, because the kids use the essay, I've taught them how to use it as, and same with our design tech teacher who has a lot of experience in building stuff and that architectural mindset of how our essay becomes the outline or the blueprint for what the model essentially is going to look like. So we really hone into that concept of how, the two, how they're all related. So our goal this year is to start in November. In the past, typically what we find is that probably more December-ish is when we get started and we work on the model December up until uh, about a week before the competition. But our goal this year is to be sooner just so we have more time in case there we do need to add something extra to the model. Then that gives us the majority of the month of January. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, we'll let um, having an accurate expense form and keeping within that hundred dollar budget, which of course includes the model and also the presentation and any special award um, uh, materials or visual aids or costumes, um, that is very important. Um, how do you track your team's costs and guarantee that they stay within the budget? Um, the the most difficult piece of that has been tracking donations um, and recyclable materials that you have to add a cost to. Um, we re very rarely have had to make outright purchases. Um, to some degree, we've had to from year to year, but nothing expensive. But we do get a lot of donations um, and a lot of recyclable materials because um, at our school, we actually leave um, the model up after we come back from competition. We leave the model up um, on display in the building until the next model comes there so that parents can see uh, what types of things we're looking for, what we've done. Um, it's before them, you know, all year long. And so they're always bringing in and donating things. And they get excited when they see their items somewhere on the Future City um, model. So that, that tends to be the hardest thing because uh, we don't spend a lot of money, but we do get some neat things that come in from parents and attaching a dollar value to it um, becomes a little difficult. But we do the best we can. We, we get feedback from others. Um, and then we just keep a spreadsheet of things that we've gotten in, um, how much value we think uh, we would assess to it. And then we go back and as we're using things, we just take it off of the spreadsheet so we know, okay, we use this, we use this, we use this item. Excellent. Great. Um, and uh, as a reminder for all attendees, uh, page 94 of the program handbook is the expense form instructions. And that's got, if you're looking for specific um, um, information or resources on approaching that, that's a really great place to start as well. Um, Leandra, um, one thing that's very important is um, making sure that the model is durable and can withstand transportation, not only for uh, the regional competition, of course, but then if your team wins first place, um, having something that is sturdy enough to be transported to finals in DC. Um, could you talk a little bit about how your team works to make sure that their model is um, durable and, and safe for transportation? Um, what kind of ways do they approach uh, making a sturdy uh, model? Uh, the big, our kids love um, hot glue guns. That's probably our biggest used supply that we end up having to purchase is the um, glue sticks, just because they do go through them to make sure everything is secured down. Um, our board from the very beginning, um, my co-leader is the one who kind of that becomes his baby. And like this year, he has been doing research with the kids on what's a lighter board, but still just as sturdy as like the wood platform we've had before. Um, so the kids research the materials. We talk about like some of the recycled materials that just get dumped off. Those donations are, some are unusable and we talk about the reasons why in terms of sturdiness. Um, we also look at like last year, we got hit with a major snowstorm in Michigan. And a lot of teams actually couldn't even compete because they were, their schools had closed for the day. I mean, it was, we had eight to 10 inches. No, it was a, a fun time right before the competition this last year. Uh, but what my co-leader had the brilliant idea of was taking saran wrap. We, we worked with the kids on wrapping the models so that they were protected. Um, and we also talked about like, as we wrapped it, like making sure everything was secure so that it wouldn't move from either the wrapping or getting placed in the truck that was moving it and so forth. Great, excellent. 
Uh, the final uh, deliverable is, of course, a presentation. Um, so the first question is for Willette. Um, how does your team practice their presentation? Do they perform in front of different groups? Um, how do you help them kind of become comfortable with public speaking? Um, our students do practice um, in front of teachers, in front of other students, in front of parents. Uh, we try to have them practice as often and as many times to whoever will listen. Um, they practice with the principal um, and they get questions from different groups. They, they even practice with kindergartners and first graders um, and just hearing their perspective and the questions that they ask. Um, so we do um, a lot of practicing uh, with our students. Um, they, they write their script based on their personalities. So um, it becomes second nature to them. So we try to make sure that their scripts um, include their form of humor or um, whatever is you know the latest tech, the latest thing as far as um, not slang per se but just using their own words so they try to make the technical aspect um, very down to earth and very real to them so that they're not just spewing out um, technical terminology that they're not quite sure what they're saying, but they're intimately familiar with what they're saying. So it, I try to make sure that they understand that this is second nature to you. You're speaking this just like you would tell me your own bio about your life. And so we try to make it very personal for them, try to make it fun for them. I know the first year that I did it, um, it was um, full of a lot of jargon and the children were just kind of memorizing portions of their essay as opposed to um, making it into something that was a real life experience for them. So I think once we decided that um, this wasn't just a formal um, presentation, but something that could be lighthearted and a little fun as well, then they were able to buy into it um, on a different level. So since then, you know, they've done all types of plays or skits uh, where they've really made it a real life experience for them. Excellent. Uh, Leandra, um, how do you prepare your, your students um, with good public speaking experience and, and practice? Uh, we're pretty fortunate that our kids have the ability to actually do a communication arts elective. And so a lot of times the ones who are a part of that are either in that course or they're ones that are like a part of the school play and they like being up in front of individuals. We talk a lot about not using those filler words when they get nervous, um, having a presenting background for different um, areas. I work with the kids on what's good techniques and bad techniques and good practices and how you prepare. Um, our kids are all about the practice model and continuing to practice and we we talk about like the ones who are successful are the ones who practice as opposed to the ones who just kind of put it all together and on a whim present so very good um, so I see that we have had uh, a number of um, questions come in, so that's great. And if anybody in the audience has any other questions, please keep uh, sending them in, um, either about the program itself or um, specifically um, for our panelists. Um, just type them into the question um, box in the webinar control panel. Uh, Maggie, do we have any uh, questions so far? Yeah, we've had a lot of great questions so far, so please keep them coming. Um, we have a couple general questions for you guys to speak to. Um, one was about how you introduce the engineering design process and project management cycle um, to your teams. Well, do you Is want that to for start? either one of us? Okay, I wasn't sure. There one, yeah. Okay, um, so our um, engineering mentor um, starts that with them actually from the beginning. Um, they have handouts that they have in regards to the um, the engineering process, and um, he teaches it as if he was teaching a, an elementary engineering class. So that's one of the key points that they have from the very beginning. Great. Excellent. And Leandra, uh, how do you uh, approach the engineering design process and project management components of the program? Um, I similarly, I kind of refer to our engineer mentor 
um, to help fill in the gaps. I go over the kids with expectations based on what's in the rubrics and areas that they need to think about and that they need to cover for all the different aspects um, within Future City. And then I pin it back on our engineer mentor as to he's the expert in the field. Um, he's the one to ask questions and he's the one who knows things. So <laughs> great. Um, and there are, all, are also, for those who might not have a mentor, there are also a lot of really great introductory activities and scripts and suggestions in the handbook and then also on um, Future City's website in the resources section. Um, another question that I'm not sure um, maybe one of you could speak to would be um, sometimes some of the teams can find the handbook a little intimidating, maybe some teachers too. It's, it's pretty long. Um, how do you make the handbook accessible for some of the students that might be um, struggling with reading or um, reading such a, a large um, handbook? Do you have any suggestions for that? I can tackle that one. Um, because we don't read it cover to cover. Um, I do, but I don't, <laughs> my kids don't. So I just pull out the various aspects. So for example, like last week when we were dealing with the city essay, all I did was copy from the handbook. There's, it's like a two page, maybe three page. I'm going off of memory right now. Um, about the city essay, which addresses all the areas they need to address, what the overview of the big problem is. And it just gives them a nice overview. And I actually read it through with them. And we talk about it. And then I, then they're kind of left on their own to start dabbling and figuring things out and then they come to me when they think they have an idea or, or ideas same with each of the components with SimCity and so forth so I only copy out certain pages the rubric like I said is probably one of the biggest references I use just because I'm able to break it down to here's the column you need to look for this is what you need to fulfill so I hone in into like if you guys want to do well and get the most points this is what you're looking at. So I don't really reference the whole thing in general because the kids see me bring the book with me every time we meet, but in the past I've noticed it's very overwhelming. So then I just chunked out, what do I find? Having done this for so many years, I can chunk out what's the most applicable for my students and what they need to move forward. A great suggestion, wonderful, thank you. Um, do either of you struggle with um, teams larger than three um, and how to choose the three presenters or who, how to decide which of the students will be the presenters? Um, I do. So we, we actually take all of our students um, to the competition. Um, we, we, we never have more than about 10. Um, but in a few years, we've had more than three who really wanted to be presenters, um, and we really just had some have honest conversations with them um, because some students wanted to be presenters, but they weren't fully equipped and didn't have the skill set to be presenters, and so it becomes difficult. But when we look at it as a whole, as what's best for the team and showing. Um, the best presentation to represent our school, um, the students understand. So they they like the fact that they're able to go. And then we try to use the students who are not presenters, actually, as the student, students who speak at the judging table. So when the judges come around, we um, have different students who are able to speak for the special awards on different topics so that each student still feels like they have um, an important role on the team that, you know, they are the, the students who can talk about fire safety or the students um, who can talk about transportation and how do you get around in the city. Um, so we try to divvy it up where the students have the opportunity to speak as um, the special awards to the judges, but the stronger students are the ones who actually present. Great. Um, and then do 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 one more, do either of you, um, it doesn't sound like you do this, but uh, maybe you have some suggestions anyway. Um, if a team chooses not to compete in the overall competition, but maybe spread their um, kind of future city experience over the course of a year, just to kind of, uh, both for the teacher to kind of undertake that learning curve and the kids to kind of get used to it. Any advice for spreading it out or kind of taking it at your own pace the first year? 
So our mentor actually suggested that this year because last year we had a team of eighth graders who all graduated, and this year we have sixth and seventh graders who have not participated in the competition before. Um, initially, we said, should we use this as a planning year where we just spend the year talking about future city, talking about engineering, um, but then we we got excited about the competition and said, you know what, let's try and go for it and see uh, what happens. And, you know, if, you know, it's not as great as we expected it to be, we knew that this was going to be a planning year anyway. And then next year when those students come back, they'll be stronger. Um, so it was a conversation, but we didn't actually decide not to compete. Great. Terrific. And that's um, exactly what we suggest folks to do. You know, don't compete if you don't want to, but try. Show up and, you know, show off what you've got done so far. And it's really fun for the kids to kind of experience that competi competition day as well. Um, we have a couple more questions coming in about mentors, but I can handle those on my own. <laughs> um, and I'm passing some off to you, Jake, also. So get, get excited for some emails. <laughs> Great. I'm sorry, I might have missed something. I had a parent come and speaking to me. I don't know if a question was asked. Nope, no, we are, uh, we've handled a bunch of the questions. If people have others, feel free to write them in now. Good, we're caught up for the moment though? Yep. Great, excellent. Um, so if you have not already, uh, please be sure to register. Um, just go to futurecity.org. At the top of the page, there's the register button. Um, and make sure you sign up. Um, also, if you have a mentor, make sure that they have actually registered too. Um, sometimes they might um, be, be doing great work, but they haven't signed up yet. So just double check with your mentor um, and make sure that they have signed up um, in the same registration section of futurecity.org. Oops. Um, and we have a couple really exciting webinars coming up soon from Future City HQ. Um, the next one will be in a couple weeks. We have our annual um, theme webinar where we'll, we'll have a number of um, experts in the field, fields of uh, clean water and clean drinking water supply um, discussing the topic. Um, that's going to be October 2nd at 4 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Central. Um, and that's a webinar that's for the whole team. So. Um, you can share the registration link with um, your team members. You can have them all watch together uh, in the classroom or after school class. Um, we're, we're, you know, it's a, it's a fun, exciting um, program for everyone of all ages. Um, so be sure to um, uh, come to that. Um, we also have for the very first time, um, we're doing a mentor best practices and advice webinar, um, similar kind of format to this webinar, um, but it'll be specifically geared toward mentors. Um, we've got a couple of really excellent long-term mentors to, to share some experiences and suggestions. Um, and so, um, um, reminder emails with registration detail for both of these will be going out um, very soon. We'll, uh, we'll be um, continuing to be sent out um, to everyone who's signed up so far for this year. Um, so be sure to um, forward any of those um, registration um, emails to your own mentors or to any friends or colleagues who you think might be interested. Um, and I don't think I mentioned it, but the uh, mentor one will be October 15th at 4 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Central. Um, and educators are welcome to attend that as well. Um, it'll be kind of geared specifically to mentors, but um, everyone um, is welcome to attend. Um, and to conclude, I just wanted to say a very big thank you um, to Leandra and Willette. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to share your experiences with us. Um, we've got some really excellent um, uh, recommendations and tips and tricks, um, and feedback. So thank you very much for um, taking the time. Um, if anyone has any questions um, that you didn't get to that you have, feel free to um, email them to info at futurecity.org. Um, and we're happy to um, address that. Um, and anything else, Maggie, before we head off? Um, I have one more question um, from Lisa, and I think it's a really great way to end. Um, she was wondering um, if the uh, educators 
um, have their teams do uh, kind of focus on uh, deliverable. So if they, you know, assign smaller teams to work on each deliver deliverable, or if they perhaps uh, have different students uh, research different topic areas like energy or transportation. Um, and how, if you've tried that, how has it gone, or what are your thoughts on that? Take to start out, uh, Bullet. Sure. So I've, we've actually tried both in the past. Uh, we've had it where all the students um, researched and shared ideas with each other because during the competition, um, sometimes students want to walk around and see other teams, and so they walk away from the table and a judge comes up to ask about something and it's like, oh no, um, Julie knew that answer. Um, so we, we've done it where um, each student has um, researched something. Um, and then we've done it where everyone kind of knows a little bit of something. What we found is that um, it's easier for us when each student has their level of expertise because then when they hear a question, they quickly know, okay, this is this person's question or this is that person's question. Um, but then at the same token, um, when someone doesn't show up or is not there or is away from the table, then it puts a strain on the group because then others don't know. So um, there are pros and cons to both sides of it. Um, I will say I do, I prefer when students know something um, they research on their own because then they become experts in that area. Um, sometimes it's better to be an expert in one thing as opposed to having limited knowledge of a lot of things. Um, but, you know, I can really go either way with the students. It depends on what, what they, what their strengths are and what they choose to do that year. Excellent. And Leandra, do you have an um, answer to that to finish off? Yeah, um, I think mostly because probably we're dealing, dealing with, we're an after school group that meets once, maybe twice a week, that the kids just kind of divvy themselves up into the deliverables. Mostly just really the big ones are SimCity and the City Essay. Um, and then they all come together for the model. So it's kind of like the first two we work together, um, the kids just become knowledgeable in their areas of the deliverable. And then the, at the model standpoint, the essay people who have become extremely knowledgeable in what the, they're doing for their city, they fill in the Sim City people. Everybody's on board with what ended up happening as the end result of this is what our city turned out to be, and then they move forward with the model. Excellent. Great. Can I chime in real quick? Mm -hmm. I, I I just want to offer encouragement to the I don't know who the question is, but the small after school program who felt blown away and slightly intimidated. I just wanted to share that we were there for many years and we even thought that maybe we shouldn't compete anymore because we would get to competition and say, oh, wow, we, we don't have a chance against these schools. And um, what we decided to do was that we just wanted to be better each year and learn each year. So we didn't we don't necessarily go into the competition um, trying to, to make it to the nationals at all, but we want to do our best. Um, and to feel that what we did this year was a lot better than what we did the year before. And so sometimes it can be intimidating to see um, what some schools are able to do, but I allow my students to walk around and just see what other schools have done and bring back ideas and say, okay, we saw this school did that. We heard their presentation because they were one of the finalists. What can we do differently? So we use it as a learning opportunity um, instead of shying away from doing the competition, we just see it as a way to grow. So I just want to encourage the smaller schools. Um, yes, it will be intimidating <laughs> sometimes, but I think if you go into the process knowing that your goal is to learn and to grow and to give a phenomenal experience to your children, um, that you'll walk away just feeling much differently. So I just wanted to encourage the smaller schools. Great. Excellent advice. Um, great. Um, well, if there's not anything else, um, Maggie, um, then I Good. think that's yeah. about it. So um, again, thank you very much, Leandra and Willette and Maggie. Um, and if um, anyone has any questions or comments, please send them to info at futurecity.org. And otherwise, have a great day and best of luck on your future cities. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.